We're back now in Piccadilly Circus, into a Piccadilly Circus which now, although it's after midnight here in London, is crowded as it's never been crowded before. Well, we've come a long way with the uh, receiver, but there's still a few things we need to cover. Uh, first of all, we haven't really talked about that hum that we have in the receiver. We're going to have to handle that, do some troubleshooting to find out if the hum is uh, something that's in the power supply or power supply lines or if it's something being picked up because we have a uh, bad shielding or possibly some type of uh, uh, ground loop or, uh, or miswire. The second thing we're going to do is uh, take a look at our magic eye tube. We've neglected that up to now. Uh, the very difficult to, uh, to get uh, VI-103 is going to be replaced with a very common Magic Eye tube. Oh, and we don't want to forget, we actually haven't done a full alignment on the receiver yet. We need to replace all of the shields as well as the covering over the various trimmers and uh, variables used to align the set. Uh, we need to go through the IF transformers, a complete alignment on the set. Okay, um, what we're trying to do now is uh, figure out where that hum might be coming from. And the first place that we want to check is the power supply itself. So I've got a couple of resistors um, that represent the, uh, the load of the receiver. I'm using a, uh, a 0.1 400 volt capacitor that I'm coupling into an oscilloscope to measure the ripple on the DC. And I've got my meter on there to measure the DC itself coming out of the power supply. I have a reference sine wave on the scope that, that is uh, 60 hertz. So let's bring up the power supply. 100 volts. As you can see we're seeing some ripple. 150 volts. And here's the full load. And you can see the ripples bouncing up and down on the scope. And this is this is uh, characteristic of uh, what you see uh, going through diodes. Now I've got the scope set for 0.1 volt per division, so I'm going to call that about 200 millivolts peak to peak. 200 millivolts peak to peak, and we've got 210 volts uh, output on the power supply. Also notice that the waveform is about double the frequency, so we know we are getting the full wave rectification. But the, the main part of the ripple is occurring at double the frequency, or 120 hertz. And of course, in, uh, in a 50 hertz system, it would be 100 hertz. So if we take that peak-to-peak uh, -peak value of 200 millivolts and multiply it by 0.3535, we get about 71 millivolts RMS of ripple. We put that into a percentage formula. We take the... Uh, the 71 millivolts and divide it by 209 volts or 210 volts and then we multiply it times 100 we'll get the ripple factor or the ripple percentage and that comes out to 0.033 percent ripple on the uh, power supply. Um, we, we know we're using a two-stage system we have two chokes and two capacitors so it's a uh, called a Pi L type filter. So that's pretty good performance. That's very very low ripple. Supply. Now, one thing I did was go in and look at the power supply and, and investigate the power supply to see if there was something in there that might give itself away. And I found an unsoldered uh, post. It was a uh, a solder lug, and I'd had all the wraps the wraps uh, all the wires wrapped around it properly, but uh, failed to solder that one connection. So it was a good exercise to reevaluate the power supply. So now that we're taking the power supply out of the equation, we're going to look at the receiver and see where that hum might be coming from. Well, I've removed the last IF stage, and notice we still have the hum. It's actually a little less when the volume control is at maximum. So we don't need to concern ourselves with any of the RF stages. This is purely an audio an audio type situation and it looks like it's coming right in the last two tubes uh, the 6V6 and the, uh, the 6Q7. Turn this off. The next thing we're going to try is to actually replace the 6V6. It is very possible that we have a tube that's got a short between the filament 
and uh, one of the other electrodes in the tubes, that would be a direct source of home. So let's take that out of the picture first. Okay, I've replaced the 6V6 with another uh, valve. No help. So it's not the tube itself. Now all I have really done is lifted, and I'm using my injection probe, I've lifted the capacitor going to the grid of the 6V6. We still have the uh, 500K ohm to ground, but we've simply lifted the capacitor off the, off the uh, input coming from the last stage. So we know the 6V6 is quiet as a mouse. Sounds good. The problem is coming from before the audio output stage. So the ne next thing we have to do is go into the wiring uh, that comes off the original audio stage. And there's also some filtering involved. This is where a lot of work has been done by the previous owner. So this is where we get into a little bit of troubleshooting of uh, other people's work. We need to talk a little bit about the audio system in the R1155. Uh, first of all, there's a little confusion over the detector circuit. If we look at the detector, we can see that it's uh, it's using one of the diode sections of the 6Q7 to produce a uh, an audio voltage that's sent uh, down to the uh, volume control and then it goes up to the grid of the triode section of the tube. But it's a little hard to read so I've uh, done some work on the uh, on the schematic and redrawn it using a semiconductor diode symbol to try to show it a little clearer for you guys that might have a little problem uh, trying to read a, uh, a tube type detector. Uh, the, uh, it's still a little bit weird and the way that they derive the audio with R26 on the bottom of the audio pot means that when you turn the volume down you're not really turning it all the way to zero. Um, I suppose that might have been a safety feature. Uh, once you're in automatic gain control um, and you turn the volume control all the way down, you can't actually turn the radio to complete zero. You're still going to hear some audio from the set. If you wanted to reduce that, you would have to reduce the value of R26. Right now that's a 100K resistor. You might take it down to a 27K and that would give you a little bit better performance as far as turning, uh, decreasing the volume so that uh, if you're using it with headphones or something like that. The most common hookup, uh, the most basic hookup, is taking the output externally off of uh, pin 6 of the Jones connector and putting that into an external amplifier. So that's a very simple and conservative way of getting audio into the set. One step uh, uh, beyond that is if you bring the 6V6 on board and put it in one of the unused tube sockets, they would typically attach the 6V6 to the uh, primary side of L30, the output transformer, the headphone amplifier transformer, attaching it right to pin 6 of the 6Q7 or the, uh, the detector first audio tube. Uh, the problem with doing that is that uh, you still have a lot of strays involved around that transformer and there's a lot of hum that gets picked up. So you'll see a bunch of articles talking about ways of getting around that and uh, in the ultimate uh, circuit they actually don't use the, uh, the transformer at all. They put in a 150 or 180K resistor and they come off the plate and use uh, RC coupling. Uh, in the ultimate uh, circuit, uh, they're even using a little bit of shunt feedback from the plate of the 6V6 back to the plate of the 6Q7 uh, for uh, giving you some really high fidelity. Now, I had a big hum problem. The way that I over overcame the hum problem was by uh, uh, changing uh, an incorrect co uh, connection that I made uh, where I had a... Uh, C105, the 0.05 capacitor, I had it going to ground and uh, instead of going up to the cathode of the, of the uh, detector tube. And that was causing a terrible ground loop. So removing that got rid of most of the hum. The second big improvement was to, instead of connecting the 
the cathode bias and the grid bias resistors, grid leak uh, bias resistors of the 6V6 to ground as uh, it was originally found in the receiver, uh, connecting it to a high tension minus. And that avoids another ground loop as well as some static current uh, that uh, messes with the bias of the, of the receiver. So, altogether, I ended up with a, uh, with a circuit that was quite usable. Uh, I added some, uh, some filtering on the uh, HT- line that's really uh, improved the, uh, the performance of the uh, receiver. Hum is now at a minimum. It works very well both in automatic gain, gain control and in manual gain control. And uh, the filter is working quite well. It gives you a nice low cut filter and uh, helps you uh, to get rid of some of, the, uh, some of the low frequencies when you're doing uh, code reception, for instance. So, uh, very interesting receiver in, in respect to uh, the way that they hooked up the audio. I do not like the way they ran the audio back and forth on the chassis using uh, shielded wires. It's still uh, a recipe for disaster with any receiver when you're running audio back and forth over the entire circuit. So we're kind of at the point where we're ready to put covers back in the RF section and uh, do the final alignment. But I just wanted to point out a few of the things that have happened in the, uh, in the audio section before we move on. First of all, uh, we have disconnected the, uh, this, the diode that goes to the DF portion of the, uh, of the receiver. And uh, let me just try to point that out. The two pins, pin 4 and pin 5 of the detector, one of those is now grounded. I've grounded pin 4. In this case, pin 5 is where the, uh, the IF is coming in for detection. Sometimes those pins are swapped, by the way, so be careful. Um, also, you can see we've got the, uh, the high voltage going through a decoupling resistor to a, a substantial, looks like a 3.3 mic capacitor to ground. And then we have the feed resistor on the plate. Uh, it looks like I used 180K. To the, you can see the uh, 1 meg feedback resistor going to the 6V6. And you can see that the 330 ohm and the 47 mic bypass are now going to this terminal strip which has the minus HT on it rather than ground. So there's been some changes to the audio. And uh, the results are that I have to turn the audio gain control pretty much full blast to hear any hum. Back when it's in the normal position I don't hear any hum at all so we've really improved the hum situation. Okay. Right now in, now in uh, manual gain control we can see that the the AGC or the gain is at minus 14 volts so that would represent minimum gain on the receiver. So let's go to AGC. So now we're in AGC. And we got minus 8 on there. So we tune around. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address? Instagram account you can see strong signals are giving about 9 volts of uh, negative bias on the AGC. So I think we're ready to uh, to do the final alignment and then get the magic eye tube working because we have a good AGC and we know that it's working fine. Now I did of course replace the AGC capacitor. So it, it's very lively, it's working very nicely. Now before I put the, uh, the cover back on, I made darn sure that all of the trimmers turned freely. And I did that by just giving them a little bit of heat with the heat gun to make sure nothing was going to crack. And then put the nut driver on there. I also have gone around and checked that all of the IF transformer slugs tuned freely. So we're ready to uh, start the alignment. 
Okay, we're going to uh, look for the AGC signal first. On the back of the Magic Eye tube, we go on this pin, and we can see we've got 6.6 .6 volts. Okay, so there's a good spot to pick up AGC for tuning the IF. Uh, I also have hooked my audio meter up to uh, the speaker terminals, so we're going to be able to have uh, indication of modulated IF. Okay, we're going to take the antenna off. Um, we're going to go directly into the grid cap of the mixer, and that's going to be our our injection point. Uh, we can again use our nifty injection probe and we'll be bringing in the IF of 560 kilohertz from the oscillator. I'm going to use a uh, 1000 hertz tone at 40 percent modulation. I'm going to be looking at the AGC voltage and I'm going to be looking at the audio on the meter and we're going to get the IF lined up. So we know that the IF frequency, the IF frequency is 560 kilohertz but if you check you will see that 560 kilohertz is a very popular frequency and there will be many AM broadcasters on that frequency. Some of these receivers had built-in traps to be able to uh, get rid of the, uh, the bleed through that came from these broadcast stations and some did not. So I've already heard bleed through as I've been playing with the receiver on different bands. It especially happens at night. And uh, I'm going to try a little trick to try to avoid some of that by deliberately tuning the IF off frequency in a place where there should not be any broadcasters. In other words, it should be in the guard band of the station. And this may or may not work out. We'll see. But... Uh, I've selected a frequency of 555. 555 kilohertz. 555 kilohertz should not have any broadcast stations on it. It's, it's what's known as a, a guard band between two stations. And we shall see if, uh, if this works out. So the first thing we're going to do is take our uh, generator down to 555. 555 kilohertz. This is what we're going to tune the IF to. So anything we can do to try to make the measurements easier is worth trying. Um, I've got the meter across the AGC. It's sitting at 2.2 volts, or minus 2.2 volts in our case. I'm going to go into the grid cap of the mixer, or the frequency changer stage. As you can see, it is responding. So we're really not too far off of the uh, the peak of the IF. If we're getting a, a response already, it's not too far off there. So I think this is going to work. Okay, let's talk about tuning tools for a second. Um, standard tuning tool is insulated down to the tip. This would work fine. For the IF can, since they're just powdered iron slugs, you can get away with a small screw, screwdriver. What I like to do is wrap the screwdriver with a little bit of Kapton tape so as not to short against the can. Once we get into the uh, RF tuning, there will be some other rules. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and over here is six. You know, when you're looking down in there, you get in there, look for where the slot is, stick the tuning tool in, and then rock it. As you can see, we're going down on both the voltage and the audio meter. Look at the audio meter, and look at the voltage. Okay, so it's very clear that we could use either as the tuning tool. We can either use the audio meter on the speaker or we can use the AGC. So we're doing a quick check after our 555 alignment. 
and we're picking up a beacon in the uh, 200 to 500 kilohertz band. Now I'm going to turn on the BFO. Oh my! What do you notice? Oh, the BFO no longer works. Why? Because the BFO was tuned to 560 kilohertz, actually 3 kilohertz off it. And now it's uh, not close to our frequency, so we need to line up the BFO again. And we can't quite do it. Okay, so I've hit the BFO with the heat gun. And what that did is that melted the wax, so I was able to turn, turn the screw of the BFO coil. Okay, so... We've got the beacon receiver. We've retuned the BFO. Not super impressed with the BFO circuit. Of course, it could be just a soft tube. So nothing's really uh, tuned up yet, but it seems to be working okay on CW. So the BFO, we're going to call that good enough for now. So when you're doing the alignment in the RF deck, uh, you've got the, the oscillator section that you're going to adjust first. That's down here. This sets the high frequency oscillator. And uh, one, remember, is your highest band, and five is your lowest band, and they mix them up. So they're not in order all the time. So keep, keep your eye on that. Also, when you're adjusting the trimmers, you're going to want a, a nut driver that's been cut down. Uh, so that you can get them through the holes to make the adjustment. Just like any receiver, the, uh, the high to low in the band spread, uh, to get that set properly, you're adjusting the trimmer against the ferrite. And uh, last resort, uh, there are veins on the uh, variable capacitor that you'll be adjusting to get any fine-tuning uh, to get the tracking correct on the bands. So. It's very standard, super heterodyne, fairly easy to line up. So we'll talk about the Magic Eye uh, tube. You know, the, the VI-103 is hard to uh, find, especially this side of the pond. And uh, the 6U5G or 6G5 or 6E5G uh, or GT, those uh, are available and those would work. Uh, in this application. Um, it is an octal socket and if you find one of those uh, octal type magic eye tubes you'll be in business. But um, I did not. I'm going to be attempting to use the 6U5 straight. The large old 6 pin type straight should fit right in there. By substituting an appropriate socket for the one that's here and we would make that work somehow. Instead, I think what I'm going to try to do is build an adapter. I've got an old socket here. It's not that great. And then we take a octal base and we put that on there in like an adapter. I think we could get away with not having to change the socket and just using an adapter. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do. Guys, not a lot of fighting in the playoffs, obviously, in hockey. Uh, and well, I gotta tell you, I spent the day yesterday, Earth Day, fertilizing my Earth shoes. I wake up this morning on different levels. Uh, something to note um, on the Magic Eye tube, I wasn't getting a full closure and full opening, so I had to take the AGC voltage and use a little voltage divider. As you can see I've got a 10 meg and it looks like a 1.1 meg which just brings the voltage down a little bit for the magic eye 
and now it uh, it's scaled properly. Now properly scaled, it's fully open to get to a station. You, you, you look at you know something is London DJ Raw. And all the time people are trying vaguely to stop. It's a fantastic track of this seething jamming mess of uh, dogs wearing fancy dress hats and the men waving tags. People are actually trying to form rings to dance. But what a hope they've got.